Welcome, everybody. First, I just wanted to thank Rick Pearl. I think a lot of us are here today because of him. His 20 years spent in Peoria changed a lot, right? The landscape here, he's worn many hats. We won't give every adjective to describe him, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's a boss, a mentor, a colleague, a friend of a lot of us. And this lectureship and this endowment will uh, be to thank him over and over again and to change uh, different topics and change what we think about uh, healthcare innovation uh, because of his time here. And so a few picks representative of Dr. Pearl and more importantly, the building we're in and the children's hospital we work at as a kind of permanent monuments to his time here. And that is awesome. When he called me and met me and said, come to Peoria, I said, no way. Um, when then I called him going, oh man, I really don't like what I'm looking at and I need to let's circle back. And he in classic Dr. Pearl fashion said, you're on a plane this week, come in here. And I was on a plane and I met him and met the team. And yeah, it was a no brainer at that point. And I think all the things that we have yet to achieve uh, because of his legacy and being on the way. So he is one in a million. Uh, I think the circle of the, you know, Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation. He talked this, told the story today that his first discussant on one of his trauma papers was my grandfather, a, a chief of trauma at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and then to, you know, work and, and be with him and, and be more similar than we're different, right? Uh, uh, which is awesome. Dr. Ponsky, Dr. Ponsky, uh, it was not a, easier choice to say, who could we come speak about innovation and education here to get the Pearl Lectureship back going again? And his career in medical school in Cleveland and residency and fellowship at DC, to then his academic career really focusing on education and making it easy and widespread um, for the masses. And, and, you know, it is awesome. And we all benefit from that on a year to year, week to week basis. And we do look forward to the TikTok videos, even the family ones and uh, the educational you know, snippets do really make it easy to, to stay current and with your company and partnership with Cincinnati Children's. So, you know, come up and we're excited to listen to the talk, uh, Innovation Moonshots and How a Cartoon Could Save the World for the second for a lectureship. It is incredibly humbling to see my picture next to Rick Pearl, the giant of Rick Pearl. Um, it has been in such an honor to be here. Um, and I will tell you, I'm still my head spinning. I was not expecting to see what we see in this building. I don't think I've ever seen a place like this uh, in the world. Uh, and to be invited here is uh, an incredible honor. Um, so the innovation moonshots and South Park, by the way, um, don't worry, it'll be a G-rated lecture, but um, this was, these pictures are just me geeking out from a TikTok video I saw where you could pick any word and put it with any, uh, describe a picture. So if you can't read it, it's innovation moonshots. And then I tried it with Rick Pearl. Can you see that? Does it work? Can you see if you squint your eyes, Rick Pearl? Um, a lot was already mentioned about Dr. Pearl. Um, uh, having in any way association with him is a huge honor for me. He has been a complete giant in the field of pediatric surgery, um, has humbly done so much that he doesn't ever talk about, but uh, his history is incredible with the fact that he flew a helicopter in two wars and uh, has then just decided to go be a pediatric surgeon in his spare time uh, and has been one of the best educators and leaders uh, in the country. So. Uh, and now I get to see what he did here. So it's an incredible honor. So what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna start about a very brief summary of kind of a very brief vision of what innovation may look like in 
in our interpretation. And I will tell you that clearly it's the same interpretation here and we would love to learn about what innovation looks like. And then we'll take you through an example of a couple of things that we've done to try to move that forward. Okay, of note, I have a conflict of interest, a disclosure, I'm the owner of a company, Global Cast MD. I've done a great job uh, in over a decade that I've made zero dollars, but, but it's okay because as Dan says, having a company as a doctor is very frowned upon historically. It's like terrible, you should never own a company. It has been one of the greatest tools of my life because it's been allowing me to do everything. By having a company, I could hire someone. I could do tasks without having to go through a million hoops and, and red tape. So having a company has been an absolute godsend. And a lot of the stuff you're gonna see is the company combined, it's pretty much been supported by Cincinnati Children's over the years. So first question, um, why do we need hospital innovation? I, I'm just curious if anyone by the way, interrupt me, raise your hand. This is meant to be interrupted, don't worry. I'm curious, like what do people say when they wanna go, I wanna build an innovation center, I wanna innovate, why? Like what's the reason? Is it to make patents? Is it to make money? Like why even go through all of this? What is the end goal accomplishment that's gonna be measurable that you're gonna say, see it worked? We did this for a reason. Um, and so, I, everything I do is I crowdsource. I never make my own decision. I ask a five million other people who are smarter than me. And I asked everyone, what do you do? And I think what we've come up with is two things. Number one, the times have changed. Used to be that if you are a clinician taking care of a patient and you wanted to know what is the, the absolute standard of care, what should you be doing to treat this patient? You kind of just knew because if you just live in the clinical world, the academic world, you know, but things are scaling so fast now. Technology is growing so fast. Look at this, doubling of, innovate, of patents every year. The number of patents is exploding. There is no chance that any doctor, any clinician in the world has any clue to say that they know all of the newest technologies that's there to solve the problems. That's a new thing. So now organizations have to have a, a dedicated effort to look and pay attention to make sure that we're seeing what's new out there. Because if you don't, you will be behind by next year. That's a new thing we did not have to do a decade ago. This is my most important hope and goal of, of innovation. I would love to accomplish something that I've seen here. What I've seen here is that, first of all, I want to get in the lifeblood of the organization that people naturally, instinctively see a problem and come up with their own idea of how this could be better solved in the future, rather than just following what they read in a book. This is what we're taught. You read it, you do it. I won't ever go, uh -uh, but there might be a better way. Just in the last few hours, Paul came up to me and showed me an app that he created and, and Trina created, everyone's creating all these technologies. It seems like it's instinct here to say, I, I want to create a better solution. That's, that's, the, the goal that we would love to accomplish is that everyone in the organization stops and says, wait, there might be a better way. This is our current state. Discoveries come in. We have a very large re research institute. Discoveries come in and they get managed as intellectual property and they get exited out by a license deal. What we would love to do is have more inputs. What we would love to do is say, can we look at Stepping back, instead of just taking inventions that come in, can we go to the very beginning, find really, really big problems, and then say, all right, let's start with the problem first and walk it through. And that's not easy in a, in a hospital because everyone's so busy to take a problem and make it into an actual product is very hard. But this is what we wanted to do. And we also wanted to look at outside technologies and be better about making sure we know what's there. So let's first start with problems. How can we actually do this? You say it, but how do you actually go and find problems and find and, and then build a solution? Who knows who this is? I will be so impressed if anyone knows who this is. Anyone? I'm gonna give you a hint. He's a bank robber. Yes, Willie Sutton, right there. Willie Sutton. And Willie Sutton was asked a famous question. Now you'll probably recognize the question. Willie, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. So we said, Where's the money of problems? I wanna to go to the bank of problems. Where do I find problems? 
So we said, in surgery, it's M&M conference. Raise your hand if you know what M&M conference is. Okay, so most of you know. This is where we go and we get beat up, basically. You go and you say, this is what I did this week. And they say, well, why did you do that? And this could have been done better. And that's where all the complications are presented each week of all the times we screwed up. And they, they say, well, this is, this is M&M. And it actually works, but it's very, when I was a resident, very terrifying. We said, what if we change the culture? What if we change it from M&M &M to M-M-N-I? Morbidity, mortality, and innovation. What if at the same conference that you're most scared of becomes the most innovative conference because we identify a problem and we say, okay, stop. Yes, we could have done better. Now, what could be invented, discovered? What can we create here that would never let that happen again? And so we would sit there and ideate. Here's, here's a technology we use. We, we learn, again, everything I get from someone else. There's a group in Israel that has a, tech, uh, a methodology called systematic inventive thinking. And the idea there is all the best ideas come from not going outside of your world, from finding around about what's already in your world and actually can solve it. And so we, we said we were at conference and there was a baby that came into the emergency room and the baby had something called a stoma. The baby's stoma, a, a stoma bag, kind of fell out. It, 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 it um, got released from the, from the abdomen and it was sitting out prolapsed and it loses its blood supply. And, and the baby didn't, had to have some bowel removed. And I asked, how often did we see this? They said, actually, it's been a few times this year. And then at another hospital I work at, same thing. I said, is it a big enough problem that we should try to address it? Yes. In two hours, we got a team together and a range of people, not just we got engineers, we got everyone you could think of came in the room and we said, well, let's use systematic inventive thinking. So let's innovate with what we have. How can we solve this? Well, the baby has a pacifier. What if we solve the problem with a pacifier? And so we did. So now in the stoma bags of a baby who's prolapsing and it won't stop prolapsing, we sew a pacifier, cut off the tip, sew it in, and it keeps the bowel inside. This happened because an hour, an hour of just saying, stop for a second, pause your day, and let's just think, could there be a solution? An hour. Think about how many things we could do if we do this routinely throughout the whole organization. It was so exciting, and so we did. And in like two or three months, we had six patents. I'm not saying they were good, but we had six patents. We had six patents. I mean, we were looking for, this is, Chuck, this is what I was saying. This is a G-tube. When G-tubes, feeding tubes kept falling out, we made one that could be implanted like a Broviac. We talked about, this was for school shootings. Could we come up with a way to neutralize a shooter? Uh, this was a way for uh, sending uh, kits to patients so they don't have to come to the hospital to adjust their brace. And this was a declogged a tube that won't get clogged, and all these other things we kept coming up with, it was pretty impressive. I didn't care about the patents. I cared about the energy that happened overnight with these surgeons that were so busy, so beaten down because they're so tired, and all of a sudden they're energized because they were part of finding solutions. And now we're going to get to moonshots, which is going to be the next part of what we're going to talk about today. As an organization, uh, Cincinnati Children's is setting forth on moonshots. Things that I think Oliver and I, uh, we talk about what's the definition of a moonshot. So this is our definition is basically saying something that if you ask like 90% of the world, they would say that's impossible. But you think like maybe you have a trick up your sleeve or something to make you think, well, we're going to shock everybody. It's very hard, but we think we can do it. So one of the moonshots, you see how cool that looks? That's another TikTok trick I learned. This is, yeah. So, um, is this by 2028, every pediatric provider around the world will have free access to comprehensive pediatric medical knowledge. Crazy, right? How many of you think it's possible? Exactly. I got 90% of you think it's not. That's what we want. Okay. So, this is a big moonshot. We intend to make it big on purpose. That's the goal. Here's the thing in the world right now, there's healthcare disparities. We know there's healthcare disparities. And you gotta, of course there's gonna be disparities. I mean, not everyone can afford the fanciest Medtronic uh, supplies. Not everyone can afford that. But here's what I would say to you. In 2023, I would say it's horrific to the fact that 
knowledge is not equal around the world. That's unacceptable to me. I get you might not have a robot, but the fact that we have different access to different new information, that should be something that should be our moonshot that we want to end. Well, here's the problem. This is the best we got on how we share medical knowledge around the world. This is the best we got. You can buy a textbook, which by the way, as soon as you open it, it's about five to 10 years old, especially how fast knowledge is growing now. You can get journals, by the way, there is exponential growth of publications now. So unless you have about 38 hours a day, you might be able to keep up with the new literature, or you can pay lots of money and travel all over the world to a regional meeting. And by the way, if you go to a meeting in Brazil, they only present Brazilian papers. And in the United States, we talk about our United States papers and Europe. So it's, it's the worst method that we think is this is how we're going to disseminate knowledge. It's time for a change. These don't work anymore. They used to work, but times are quite different now. So we wanted to see how can we come up with a better way of doing this. First, regularly identifying critically important new information. With so many publications, how can we at least identify what is worth sending around to the world? How do I identify from thousands and thousands of publications? So here's a, it used to be that it was manageable. Now, if an article is published, and let's say this is a critically important article, that same month, all of these other articles are published. How are we supposed to in any way know what's important and keep up with this? This just, it's not practical anymore. So how can we identify? This is a, a growing problem. This is medical publications over time. It's on an exponential growth curve. It's doubling. So what? So in the 19, in 1950, it was the doubling time was 50 years. Now it's 73 days. Every 73 days, the amount of literature we have right now will be doubled 73 days from now. OK, good luck keeping up and making sure that you're aware of everything you're supposed to know in medicine. So it sounds like a lot, but I'm going to tell you a little story. Describe to you the impressiveness, is that a word? Impressiveness of exponential growth. Who has heard about King and the Rice? Two people. All right. Once upon a time, a guy invents the chessboard. True story, this part is, the rest of it's not. But the guy invents a chessboard and he takes it to the king and the king says, this is the most incredible game I've ever seen. What can I do to repay you? And the guy says, I'm a simple man. I don't want money. All I want is rice. The king says, how much rice do you want? He says, well, let's, let's play a game. You liked my board. Let's play a game. Put a grain of rice on the first square and just keep doubling it. So do two, do four, do eight, do 16, and I'll take it home to my family. King says, that's a great idea. Gets a couple buckets of rice. And then what happens is he just starts realizing when he gets to the second row, uh-oh, a big number doubled is a problem. And then all of a sudden, the whole room starts filling up with rice. And then the palace fills up with rice. And the whole country of India fills up with three feet of rice. And he finally finished putting rice on the chessboard. So when I tell you that knowledge is doubling every 73 days, that's nothing small to think about. That is a problem of knowledge access. We are not going to know what's important if we still stay on the same way we're doing it now. 16 quintillion, if you were trying to figure it out. OK, why is it changing? I would say that this was sort of my dad's era. He, he was able to keep up because beginning of his career to his end of his career, yes, it was doubling, but he was on the first half of the chessboard. And I say, yeah, but dad, I'm on the second half of the chessboard. It is a different world. So you can't compare how we shared knowledge before to how we share knowledge now. So I finally figured out the answer. I know how we're going to do this. I know how we're going to get all the new knowledge every day into every clinician's brain. This is it. You're going to wake up and you're just going to get it put in your brain. And you're going to go to work. It's going to hurt a little bit, but you're going to know pediatric surgery for me at the end of the day. Because I added so many, I don't have time. By the way, uh, Neuralink and other companies are starting to come out for uploading and downloading thoughts to your brain. Look up Neuralink and Elon Musk company. It's happening. So until this happens, until we can upload in the morning with our cup of coffee, 
I was told this book by a guy named Anthony Chang, and it's called Harnessing Our Digital Future. And I covered up the three other words because I'm going to show you one at a time. This is the best I know how to do right now. I just follow what this book's talked about, which are the three strategies that digital will be affecting us in the future. So let's do number one, machine, machine learning, artificial intelligence. How can you have a talk today without the least mentioning AI in every single talk? So we wanted to know, could we use AI to do this? So we said, well, how can you teach a computer what's good, what's important? That's kind of hard, right? So we said, well, what if we at least say that the methodologies used by editorial boards for now is a reasonable approach to deciding when something should be published or not. So we said, can we teach AI to be at least as comparable to an editorial board? So we started with only 520 abstracts and we were able to get an 85% negative predictive value. That means that the machine was able to predict that it was a bad paper and should be rejected 85% of the time. The data scientists say, if I would just give them 520 more, they'll get it up to 95%. So we're getting close to a machine being able to decide if a paper is good or bad. Interesting. That's controversial. How would you feel if the machine rejected your paper? You're like, I want to recount. All right. This is my favorite slide. All right. So you're on who wants to be a millionaire? And you don't know the answer. By the way, does anyone know this answer? Yeah. OK. So. You don't know the answer, you want a lifeline. Who here would, I'm assuming you guys all know what these lifelines are. Who would choose 50-50? Cut out half the answers. One, two, three. Three people would choose 50-50. Now, they say you can call the smartest person in the world that you know on this topic. Who would phone a friend? Raise your hand. I can't count, but that's probably around 30 or so. All right. Who would poll the audience? Okay. So if you phone a friend, you'll be right 66% of the time. If you ask the completely uninformed audience behind you who knows nothing about laughing, 91% of the time. This is the biggest mistake we've done in education and in information dissemination. We rely on what we consider to be a core of experts, and we say, now you decide what we should all be reading. When in fact, it's the crowd. The crowd, I say always, right? I've been challenged by people to say, slow it down, Todd. It's not always the crowd, but I think a lot of the time it's the crowd. For something that has an answer, the crowd is pretty much always right. Okay? Great book on this. Um, so that leads us to the crowd. This is the book. You can scan it if you want. Once upon a time, but this is a true story. Once upon a time, a guy named Francis Galton takes an ox to the state fair. For fun, he asked 800 participants, how much does the ox weigh? He, he got an average of 1,197, and the actual weight was 1,198. This has been repeated over and over again, and it's always spot on every single time. And we're talking like little kids are guessing. The crowd. We do not use the crowd enough for us to decide what's important. Malcolm Gladwell's favorite journal is Social Science Research Network. There's no editorial board. It's all the crowd that decides which papers we should be accepting and reading. So here's the question. We talked about AI. How can we use the crowd of clinicians to help decide what is the best Doc, best resources, best information. We've been scratching our head about this for a decade. There's got to be a way to get the best, smartest people from all over the world to come together to every day help us decide what we should be paying attention to. We accidentally stumbled upon the answer. Accidentally, like the best things happen. We were trying to solve another problem. We were trying to solve a problem that when a clinician goes to see a patient, because there's such an explosion of information and because it's now fragmented in a million places, it's really hard to find what you're looking for at point of care. You might have to go to a binder and look at your protocols. You might have to go to the hospital intranet and walk over to a computer and see what is our 
thing here, or you just go to the internet, which is exploding. So we said, this is a problem, and we wanted to develop the third thing, which is a platform. Machine, platform, crowd, the three things. Great book, by the way. So this is building a platform. We wanted to be able to say that where it used to be easy, because there wasn't a lot of sources of information, reading in a textbook would give you the answer. Now, this is the situation. There's a million places to go. It's, every day it's getting harder and harder to know which one you go to, how many different apps and websites are you supposed to have on your phone, how many often do you have to keep going to the internet. This became impossible for people to aggregate all the fragmented sources of information. So we said, let's bring this all together and create an aggregation mechanism, kind of like Spotify for music, that allows you to make a playlist of everything you use, whether it's a website, a video, uh, blah, 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 blah. It keeps it in your palm of your hand, in the pocket. So while you're taking care of patients, you can have everything regardless of where it comes from. And this could be videos, it could be websites, it could be your own documents, whatever. And so um, this is what we built at Cincinnati Children's. So they have, they designed it the way they want. Those are their trauma protocols and they have those. And then they can go to uh, guidelines. So these are guidelines by disease, whatever they want. Every hospital makes up their own sort of categories and their own stuff of, of how they treat patients. Um, we have, this is their resident medical student handbook. They have the phone directories, whatever it is. That's what they want. Okay, great. It's really good. It really helps us. We rely heavily on it now. Every day we go check the app, check the app, check the app to see what it is. Fine. By the way, this is also, you can make playlists by disease if you want to do that. All right. And then the, and then the best stuff goes into the main news feed so everyone can kind of see what is being uploaded by others. But here's where it became magical. This was unintended. This was, by the way, again, none of these, every idea comes from smarter people. One of the, uh, peop, uh, Dr. Mira Kodigal said, you know, if we do this, and then a woman named Katie Russell at Intermountain Health said, I would love to have access to someone else's list. I said, oh, that's it. So we made a portal and we said, what if hospitals just share with each other? Why does it have to be so, so siloed? And so now you can actually portal in, choose your hospital and go see all the guidelines and protocols they have if you have that agreement with them, which I'm finding everyone's okay with sharing. It's, it, it, there's no one's keeping anything close to their chest. This is how we treat our transplant patients. This is our protocol for diabetes. This is, and why, so imagine now what's happening is you had one hospital that had it. Now you have all these other hospitals that are getting it. And what's happening is for the first time ever, we're having crowdsourcing and sharing of information so that we can truly start identifying what's important for the world. And so this has really helped uh, spread knowledge around the world. So that, just one last thing, and then we're done. That was how we pull information. I call it push and pull. Pull means if you're going to look for something, you easily can get it instantly. That's half the battle. Because if you only have pull, stuff that you think you want in your pocket to find, you're missing things you didn't know you didn't know, right? That's why we believe in push. There's pull and there's push. It's there to retrieve when you need it, but how do we make sure that we're constantly showing people things they didn't even know they were looking for? Almost like the news. How can we make like the news where we're pushing out what's new and important? How can we actively send out critical messaging? So this gets to number three. If we identify something that's important, we recognized that the only way we can get it to the masses is to follow the trends, not do it the way we did it before, not send it out in a journal, not announce it at a national meeting, figure out how are tens and hundreds and thousands of people and millions of people getting information. This is how they're getting information. They're not going to the library anymore. They're not going and reading 68 journals a day. It is what it is. You can be angry. You can throw tomatoes at me. I don't care. It's, this is what it is. People listen. They, re, they, they watch videos. And they, they do social media. So instead of us fighting it like we've been doing forever, let's join the crowd and say, this is massive dissemination. We should use it for good. How can we use social media, video media, multi, all this stuff for good? So what we wanted to do, and by the way, we're becoming impatient. 
the best videos, the most watched stuff is under two minutes. That's why TikTok is way above YouTube now because people want stuff in 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes. They, seven minutes to watch it? No way that someone would do that. Now it's like 30 seconds. So instead of books, journals, and meetings, we want to now go to audio, video, and social media. So we have had this campaign of taking everything important and converting it to media so it can be consumable and disseminated to the masses. And it's a, a science to it. We figured this, like we call it this education engine. If you take an, an article, and I have no attention span, so there's no way I can read a 15 page article. I need it summarized. So what we do is we summarize it and we summarize it in a way that would catch people's attention. We got to get them to watch it, okay? We take an important article, we summarize it, and then we disseminate it. And so we make 30 second, this is, we always say, this is an article you need to know about. This is a, uh, a more in-depth thing. This is an anatomy thing and how to do a tech, whatever it is, we need to make them engaging. We have to have the same criteria that like the, the media does. We have to be engaging, keep their attention, has to be consumable. And then you're gonna start seeing a movement of the needle of knowledge around the world. It takes a proactive effort to not just send out an article and think the world's gonna read it. You need to actually convert it into a way that will be consumed. All right, here's, an, here's a video. Here's a video, one of the first videos we ever did about an article. I'm just gonna play this for a second. Now, see, seems kind of, it was engaging. By the way, we had, I think within a week, 50,000 views compared to the article, which didn't even, I mean, it's, this is the way of getting people's attention. Here's the problem. You saw the end product. Now try to take all the clinicians and people around the world to start making content at mass. And that is not practical because this is what really happened. The magic. So it's just not practical. So over the years, we've been like, how do we do this at scale though? We have, remember by 2028, we have to have every single piece of information out to the world. That was our moonshot. So how can we do this at scale? So I don't have time to get in front of a camera, but what if I could just use my voice and then just have a little cartoon talking for me? And Dan, my boss, without him knowing, we did the same to him. This allowed us to do it much faster because I could record five at a time and it could be put to, to uh, um, cartoon. Okay, now for the end, we're gonna see how do we scale this. Now remember the moonshot only works if you have a trick up your sleeve because this would take us thousand years to scale every single new piece of content. I'll show you this video. This is a script completely generated by AI, of course. And I said, I am a doctor. I am a pediatric surgeon. I want to make a video about inguinal hernias directed to patients, blah, 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 blah. Give it all the prompts. So that was an AI script using stock footage, and all I had to do was stand in front of a camera, but still, it took my time. This is AI. Right, so that was my voice-ish with AI. So all we did is type in the script, and it produced 
the voice, and then we used AI generated avatars to met. So it's not perfect, but again, if we want to scale and we want to get the most important critical articles that have been identified by the crowd or AI, then we identify them, then we need to, in a matter of an hour, convert it to media that we know people will watch and we need to get it out there. That's the plan. Identify, convert it to something people will watch and disseminate it. We think we'll be able to get everything out to the world and have a regular uh, cadence of content. And by the way, this has to be a partnership with other hospitals all over the world to do this together. It's a little more advanced. So there was no human hurt in this video. This, this was all 100% done with computer. There was no me in this. Um, we checked to make sure we agreed with the script, but that's the only human involvement, except for the video had to be edited. Now I'm gonna show you something in a second. This is the last one and it's totally creepy. So I'm preparing you that it's creepy, but at least imagine what it might be like in the future. OK, so that's creepy, right? Because that's just taking a photograph of me having, I talked for, I read, I think, like 30 seconds into the thing. It got my voice. I uploaded a picture. I uploaded the script. And it just made everything, right? It, it's dangerous. I get it. I understand. But I'm just saying these are the possibilities. So to end, I want to so show how far can we go today with generation of content? I just showed you that the limitation was the video creation and the editing. I still need a video editor. What if I don't? So I'm going to show you a clip. Who here has seen South Park, the show South Park? Okay, so you know South Park. In case any of you haven't, I'm going to play like a 10 second clip of South Park. And it happens to be about ChatGPT, so I thought this was a good clip to show. Okay, now you can go in and say, I want a South Park episode about this, and these are the characters I want. Go. That's it. Oh, oh, sorry. Pretty close. on creepy. Okay. <laughs> Pretty crazy, right? So that shows you the potential of uh, what time or what time what time do I have to end? Okay, so I could do one more thing or we could end here. Do you want to do one more thing? Okay, we'll do one more thing. So oh I don't I might not be able to click on one more thing. Let's see. Oh maybe I can. Yeah. All right, we'll do one more thing. That was knowledge. What about surgical technique? How can we massively disseminate surgical technique around the world? This happened on a Memorial Day. I was outside and my friends from Chile called me and then he had someone from Ecuador and uh, Brazil. And we were all on the phone in WhatsApp watching as he was doing his case, guiding him. Okay, so this is the concept of something called surgical telementoring or surgical telepresence. Can an expert be there while you're doing your case watching, helping, guiding, thinking of all the other things you could do with telepresence, right? This is the guy that trained me.
Okay. So this took off. We, I became obsessed with this. And so for the past, I don't know, seven to 10 years, we've been trying to see how far we can take this. And so we've been making partnerships with countries, uh, with hospitals in different countries, so we can really maximize the distance and show. Uh, this was Norway, where they booked a full day of cases. Now, we believe there's a setup to get there. You can't just start like getting on a Zoom call with someone and assume it's going to work. I went there, we met each other, we did cases together, and then I went back and we showed that we could escalate the learning curve by doing this telepresence. Um, this is at three in the morning, so forgive my appearance. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, but anyways, I'm basically talking through um, how to, oh yeah, it's unavailable. So it's essentially just like you saw before, just me with the iPad, touching the iPad, saying, go here, go here, do that. But do we have enough surgeons? Is this practical? Like, are, are, are the surgeons in here going to be able to take days off of work and the hospitals going to be like, no problem, just go help people? I mean, yeah, it's great in theory, but it probably won't work. So can we use AI to embellish this? And so if you look, if you know the story about Memorial Sloan Kettering, they used Watson. It's not so good anymore, but they used Watson and it was able to, to identify cancer. Uh, almost as good as the radiologist. I think it got to the point where it's as good or close. Um, and so the, what they did is they uploaded CAT scans over and over, and they said this, 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 and they taught it, and eventually it was able to learn tumor. So my question is, what if we could upload surgical anatomy, upload CAT scans, upload technique over and over again? Do we think it could get to the point where we could teach an assistant to say, hey, you're getting close to the hepatic artery. Hey, the tumor is to the right, or something like that. So this is a mock-up I made of what this may look like. So in conclusion, we are reaching for the moon. May not happen, but we're reaching for the moon. We're hopefully going to be able to identify what's important through the noise. We are trying to transition into a dissemination plan that will be in line with how people are actually getting information these days. And we want sharing around the world. It's a new concept. Hospitals should be sharing what they have with each other so that if you have a hospital, some uh, developing country, you should be able to see what is the absolute top protocols in the world as determined by the crowd of hospitals that are using a sharing platform. And we want to have more surgical collaboration, and eventually we want to democratize knowledge around the world. Thank you very much. So, so we have time. So who wants to throw a tomato? Because I'm sure there's something I said that does not agree with some of you. Yeah. I knew Rick was going to have a question. Yeah. A present surgery. Yeah. Like Norway. Right. Is there enough lag that they're actually operating the state can be made? Yeah. You know, if they're operating with it, it's not. It's yeah. It's funny. I actually, it's not funny. I have a video of St Steve saying to me, Todd, stop, right? So first of all, we, there's been a couple of articles that I say we published. My name was on it, but I was definitely not the smart one on the paper of people that have looked at the technology of the, there's restricted crit criteria you have to have as far as bandwidth, as far as, I, I way glanced, glossed over this. This is a very complex process that has a lot of steps to get you from a licensing standpoint, from a, a credentialing standpoint, from a, a patient consent, uh, from a technology standpoint, we've, we've gotten pretty good where it's all those things are accounted for. Um, and the surgeon should never be doing the operation if they can't do it on their own. It's just additional expertise there as an additional support. So what so I'm saying, so we, if you don't, we don't have lag in the, and what we've used, but if you did have lag, you can't do it. You can only do it if you have the appropriate determined by SAGES, which is the society that determined what's the reasonable lag time. And right now, 
it, it's not an issue. But you're right, in developing countries, it might be. Other, yes. Yes, it does. Right. So my answer, the question was all this stuff about exploding information and that is equally as bad as good because it's misinformation. And that's what we saw during the pandemic is a lot of battle between different sides of, 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 of a narrative. I will tell you my answer right now initially is that we failed because we were not, at the, the medical community was not nearly as good at creating engaging, informative, trusted content on social media. It was a way imbalance of misinformation to accurate. It's because we don't do it. We're not in the mode of creating engaging content. We say, forget that TikTok stuff. I'm going to go back to doing. So I think as an, organ as, as an institution, healthcare needs to adopt this and embrace this as opposed to saying that's just not us. As far as how to shut down misinformation, that is not my expertise. I have no idea how we would battle that. Yes. For sure, but sp always, but in, t in terms of what would you be concerned about? Oh, so this is not in any way integrated into any medical records or anything. This is a freestanding platform, so it doesn't go into, into Epic or anything like that. Um, and I'm, I'm sure as this, when, when this came out, remember we built it for another thing, it was never even intended for this. So probably we'll get way smarter people who will be able to build something much more robust. But right now it's not, no hot, we've, every hospital that's used it has not had a concern because it's in no way tied to their infrastructure. It's a freestanding separate thing of sharing. It's um, so, but could people upload bad information? That's a big concern we have is just in general, do we allow anyone to upload content? Right now we don't allow individual users to upload content. They have to be academic medical centers, okay? Or and it doesn't have to be, it can be any medical center, right? But it has to be an established medical center. Some people say that's not right. You just said the crowd knows best. You should let the crowd upload. But we're struggling with this balance of not wanting terrible content on there. Yeah. So I want to make sure I understand, because let me tell you this, and then you correct me if I don't answer this right, okay? Where's the source of the content, first of all? How is it starting? There's this abyss of information. How do you even begin? Like, where's the source? So initially, we were terrible. Like, everyone criticized us. We would basically just flip through and say, this one's good, this one's good. And then, then we stepped it up where we said, all right, let's ask of each of these journals, let's ask the editorial board to tell us who they, like it was very manual and rudimentary. The, the method we're doing now is we aren't even in, in getting involved in the source content at all. We, we now sit back, let organically hospitals start uploading for themselves what they believe is the best and it just happens organically. We might find this was the wrong approach, but it seems to happen organically on its own right now. So we are not even getting involved in looking for source. So if if you're, what do you do? Surgery, okay, so pedi pediatric general, sur uh, all surgery, what? The whole thing, okay. Well, that's actually interesting, so all specialties, right? So right now, you have to have enough of a cohort within each vertical of specialty where it actually starts making a difference where enough people are uploading and sharing. Um, and you, speaking of, you said you're a nurse? Okay, so we actually believe that's the biggest opportunity for this. Um, we're finding the most interest in that, as opposed to, I was starting off just because I'm a surgeon, I was like, oh, it's, surgeons will upload stuff. And we're like, no, no, that's actually not even close. Um, so by far, it's turning out that our, our most popular users are nurses, and they are, so the question is, do the nurses create separate channels? And I said, why? They're like, we want a nursing channel. I said, why? What's the difference between nursing channel? So we're trying to figure out how to, 
how to involve ourselves, but also sit back and let it happen organically. Did I answer? Sort of. Not really. That's all right. I'll try better later. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Love your question. You're totally right. Here's my question back to you. With each level of automation that we advance, something manual is going to go away. As we get, so how well do we all know the Krebs cycle? Okay, we don't memorize it anymore. We used to, but now we have a lot more things to memorize. You just can go look it up. I think that we, first of all, this wasn't the first thing you want, you talked about was how do we teach people to critically appraise an article? I would love to get to the point where we don't actually think you need that needs to be such an important skill because we're getting better at doing that at scale. That was a manual process because we didn't have a better way. I, I, I think it's a good point. We might find that we need to have dedicated methods to make sure people still uh, know how to do that. Surgically, I do laparoscopic hernias. People always say, but don't you remember how to make the incision and do it open? Eventually, as you learn new technology, something has to go away. And the question is, how comfortable do we feel about moving from memorization to access? That instead of memorizing the whole textbook, you don't have to memorize the whole textbook. You just have it immediately at your fingertips just, fingertips just in time. That wasn't what you were asking, but I think anytime we automate, some skill is going to go away. Any other questions? Yes. I don't have an answer. I will tell you, you said there are ethical things with this. Oh boy, yeah. there's a lot of ethical things. Like, yep. No, what's your name? Stephanie, you hit on such an important point that I, I always forget to mention because it's so critical. Almost every slide I showed has an ethical concern to it, right? It's like, awesome, we can automate now and we can do deep fake videos and we can use AI to tell us like every single one of these could be terrible. So always as we're moving forward with technology, there needs to be a way to govern to make sure we're not going crazy. That's with everything. Um, and so every single thing you just mentioned is absolutely a possibility. And I, yep. An oversight body that's making sure things, yeah. As this grows, I think we need that. We probably need it now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so a few things you mentioned. First of all, number one, so um, you are totally right. I'm a, I am one of the worst offenders of that. I get super excited, right? And then just want to tell everybody about something I saw that I think is the coolest thing without having spent 
six months to make sure I am an early excitement person, right? Which is very dangerous for something like this. So there needs to be a methodology for a, for a, for a validation process to make sure it's ready to go up. I will tell you if this will make you feel better, and then I'll get to the legal part, which I have not answered. At the Division of Pediatric Surgery at Cincinnati Children's, it is such a stringent process. Nothing goes up there. There's a lot of stuff that could go up there that doesn't because we want to make sure it's been absolutely uh, validated, tested. And if there's something that we put up as a guideline, this is a big debate. Sean St. Peter is a pediatric surgeon at Kansas City. And he, he argues with um, our division chief, Greg Tiao. Greg Tiao, our division chief, says we should never post anything that has not been proven to be the right guideline. Even if we do this here, until it's proven, we can't put it on there. Sean says, that's crazy. You're not saying this is proven. You're saying this is just what we do here. Not everything we do has been proven yet. That could be another two decades from now. This is what we do. We need a big disclaimer. We're not saying this is published data. This is what we do as a protocol as opposed to a guideline. And so now regarding the legality, um, a lot of people can get concerned about the stuff that's up there on what is the legality of posting stuff on this privately held platform. And each of these are so being addressed one at a time. There are questions that have come up and there's a multitude that, I, but that where are we allowed to, to do this? Regarding putting something before a patient, like how has a, again, majority of what's going up there now is not so much like, oh, we did this great exciting thing. It's more about this is our protocol. This is our guideline. These are our educational tools. These are our PowerPoint lectures that we use for teaching. These are technique videos that we use that are standard technique videos. It's not like, hey, check it out. And then the pushing of content, we don't push stuff until it's been vetted by an, an entity uh, of uh, peer review. We don't ever push anything that we just think is cool and exciting. Yeah. So we have three methods. You can follow, like, but the one that I, so videos, and then they start trending. So that news feed will show the most trending things. But you know what metric I think is the most important? That's, I think anytime someone copies it over into their own is a high uh, validation tool. So we would have, how many times has this been added to someone's collections? And then that is a tool to say, this is probably something we should be paying attention to. The problem is the popular people get followed and just because they're cool and popular, their stuff gets put and doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. Um, I think you first, because you, and then we'll go to, yeah. Yeah. Right. Because I would not have done that. This was from Chile. So, and I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. Like, well, I did it once and you, I got in trouble. Yeah, so we did once. So we, we, we FaceTimed, someone was doing a hernia and like they FaceTimed me and I was like, so yes, that is not the right way to do it. So if we're doing this at scale, that's why we're actually, we were talking today about platforms that have a HIPAA compliant quality and it's all under quality improvement. So it's not even discoverable. It's all in the name of quality improvement. So yeah, don't follow like what I do because I'm probably not the best example. Um, but this is the the ideas that are happening, and we we don't broadcast our cases like that outside of the hospital. Um, good question though. Yeah. Great question. We don't, I, we have not at all done it by zip code to look at rural versus urban or, or, or demographics at all. We've done it only by regions of the world and we can make assumptions based on that, which is very poor. Um, but 
th only 30% is United States. 70% is the rest of the world. So it is it very, dis and it's every continent, every place is using it at different levels. Um, but we can see which regions of the world use this most. All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been great. Appreciate it.